Good afternoon. I'm Larry Verbit, chairperson of the Beverly Hills Bar Association's Entertainment Law Section. On behalf of the Entertainment Law Section's Executive Committee, we'd like to welcome you to the section's annual Ken Ziffrin presentation. This is the 13th year that Ken has graciously agreed to provide his insights into the state of our industry, and we thank him for his continued participation. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping announcements. You are all welcome to join in and participate in the activities of the Entertainment Law Section. We plan, to, we plan multiple programs throughout the year, including crossover programs with other sections of interest to entertainment law practitioners, as well as several social events. We meet monthly on the first Wednesday of every month at 8.30 a.m., presently via Zoom. If you'd like to participate, please contact the BHBA office to have your name added to our meeting notice list. Our next program will be on Monday, September 27th, uh, focusing on child labor issues and other related labor issues, uh, one of the panelists will include David Gurley from the Labor Commissioner's Office. Materials link uh, was provided to you uh, on notice of the meeting, and you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that is included with your certificate. This program is generously sponsored by Variety, Jams, and E-Minutes. I now have the pleasure of introducing you to Susan Rabin to introduce Ken. Susan is a former chair of the Entertainment Law Section who has coordinated this program since its inception, and we're grateful for her continued participation. Susan, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, welcome, everybody, again. It's lovely to almost see you. We can't really see you, but we know you're here. And we understand we have uh, almost 400 people in attendance across the country and places uh, across the oceans, which is fabulous, fa fabulous. And I'm not sure Ken uh, knew that he'd become such a social media influencer, but he is. We're so grateful that um, 13 years ago when we decided to get one of our Entertainment Lawyers of the Year to do a program for us, and Ken's name was the obvious choice, that he agreed. And Ken actually thought that uh, this would be a one-off, but uh, graciously he's accepted renewing the program every year for the past 13 years. Perhaps we'll be in person next year. I do wanna point out one thing in your handout materials, the uh, digital entertainment group on their materials at the bottom of the second page is a link in case any of you would like to follow that link, you'll get digital entertainment terms and definitions, which I found helpful. And it's uh, from their website, degonline.org. Uh, as, as I say, it's at the bottom of your materials of the DEG materials at the bottom of the second page. Uh, we're going to have questions and uh, we welcome all of your questions toward the end of the program. Ken will speak, uh, usually it's about an hour or so, we'll let you know. And I would appreciate if you'd put the questions in the, uh, not in the chat section, but in the question and answer section so that we have them all in one place. There's at, at the bottom of my screen is a doc which has access to Q and A. So, Feel free at any time during the program to pose your questions, and at the end, uh, Ken will handle them. Uh, so fellow uh, Northwestern alum, Ken Ziffrin, we were in the same class, and uh, it's nice to stay connected. And thanks again for all of you being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ken. Take it away. Thank you, Susan, very much. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, in three sections as usual. Uh, the first will cover uh, M&A and litigation issues that have come up. The second will be in the motion picture area and the third in television slant OTT. Uh, and then at the end, uh, any questions you have, I'm happy to try to answer them. Uh, so since uh, the last time we were together, uh, which was November 30th last year, 
a whole bunch of <laughs> events uh, have formed the uh, horizons. Uh, in the M&A area, uh, in May of this year, Warner Media and Discovery uh, agreed to merge, but strangely, with management control in Discovery, which is the equity holder of 29% of the joint venture, whereas Warner Brothers, Warner Media has 71%. But management controls are vested, as it were, with David Zasloff, who is the Discovery CEO. The two companies actually spent $19 billion last year on content, which is more than either Netflix or Disney. The new firm will also have a uh, linear cable presence in the United States equal to 29% of the viewing time uh, last year the goal of the two of them will be to try to save three billion dollars uh, in costs uh, as they merge. For AT&T, unfortunately, the deal represents an admission that its foray into the entertainment area has flopped. Since it bought Time Warner in 2016, at an enterprise value of 110 billion, and this deal values Warner Media for far less. Additionally, it had purchased uh, DirecTV in 2015 for 67 billion in uh, enterprise value, but in February of this year, it unwound that by making a deal with a venture company, TPG, that valued it at only $16 billion. DOJ approval is necessary for this deal to close. It is presently anticipated to close in the third quarter of 2022, so it's still a way off. Another major development occurred uh, when Amazon agreed to purchase MGM for eight and a half billion dollars. Why? Arguably for its library of United Artists titles pre-1986. Let me take you back for a minute. In 85, Ted Turner bought all of MGM and UA, but over that period of time from 85 to 86, released a dozen films, none of which cleared their prints and ads. As a result, he was more or less forced to, in effect, sell MGM titles even though they retained the MGM moniker. So what it looks like is that the MGM uh, films are really UA films pre-86, uh, but as I said, the moniker of MGM continues from that point forward. In addition to getting all of that UA library, uh, Amazon will also get experienced management in features and TV, plus a decent library of TV projects on a gone ongoing basis. The FTC approval is required for this to close and already there are some union spoilers that have come in trying to upset the transaction and unwind it. 
So we'll see what happens there. Moving across the uh, continent, in France, TF1 and M6, two large French broadcasters controlling over three quarters of the French TV advertising market plan to combine subject to regulatory approval and that was announced also in May of 2021. It's also anticipated there will be further consolidation of television in Europe. For example, BritBox, which is owned jointly by BBC and ITV in the UK, is likely to combine with TV Now, which is owned by RTL, uh, a European group of broadcasters. And speaking of which, coming back to this con continent, but staying geographically in Europe, Sky, which is now owned by Comcast and NBCU, and Showtime, owned by Viacom CBS, announced recently the formation of a European streaming service called Sky Showtime last week. This will be a 50-50 joint venture exhibited through a subscription basis in 20 European territories <clears throat> using content controlled by the parent companies of both of the venturers. This is in addition to a previously announced uh, a, arrangement in the UK, Germany, and Italy, where v Viacom projects will be uh, handled and controlled by Sky in those three territories. Up above us in Canada, Rogers Communications agreed to merge with the telecom rival Shaw Communications and a $20 billion deal that brings together the two largest cable operators in Canada and creates a wireless powerhouse. That was announced in March of this year. Rogers has the largest wireless share there at roughly 11 million customers and Shaw is number four with two million subs. Rogers will expand post-merger in 5G networks across Western Canada. Next, Foxtel, an Australian-based cable TV business, is looking to do an IPO if it can persuade their, its shareholders, News Corp, who owns 65%, and Telstra, which owns 35%, to list on the Australian Stock Exchange and in a weird way, or in a right way, go public. Formerly dominant in this country, Foxtel, it has watched Netflix gain almost two-thirds of TV subs from the overall two-thirds of the total television households in Australia from a standing start a few years ago. And it has been, if you will, outmaneuvered uh, by, uh, by Netflix uh, in that period of time. Lionsgate has acquired a 20% equity state in July in Spyglass Media Group. Spyglass had previously purchased the Miramax Film Library in a bankruptcy auction three years ago. And Spyglass, in essence, has sold that library to, um, M sorry, to Lionsgate. Lionsgate has a long track record of monetizing library acquisitions 
over the years from uh, Artisan to Trimark to Summit, and it itself may be viewed as an attractive takeover target. Finally, on the litigation front, you may recall that last year we had a pending case between the WGA on the one hand and WME and CAA on the other. In December of last year, the U.S. District Court ruled in favor of the WGA. Shortly thereafter, CAA settled the case by agreeing to cease packaging and to reduce its ownership in production affiliates to not more than a 20% equity interest by June of 2023. After further skirmishes, WME also agreed with the Guild, so both agencies are now looking for unaffiliated purchasers to take over control of their respective production units. So that's my report to you on M&A and litigation. Uh, next, we go to theatrical production distribution and cinema. We'll start with the proposition that nothing has materially changed in the sequential distribution of feature films since I last spoke to you in November of 2020. The feature world remains in convulsions and experimentation. Four of the five major studios have altered their windowing and business plans from B to C, a B to B to B to C. And the holdout, Sony Pictures, has decided to maintain its role as an arms dealer moving from media to media with third party uh, licensees. Up until 2020, or better yet, up until the pandemic arose in March of 2020, all of the major studios started and remained with product exclusively, I'll underline that, in the theaters for 76 to 90 days, with the exception of having non-theatrical traditional, like uh, uh, Army, Navy, hotels, motels, and so on, uh, that would encroach in theory on that uh, exclusive right. EST then kicks in after the 90 days, this is history now, for two weeks exclusively, followed by transactional VOD and physical DVD. There was at that point in time no PVOD or premium VOD, didn't exist. Premium pay, such as HBO, Stars, etc., occurred seven to eight months after theatrical release for an 18 month license period, which was then followed by ad supported or also known as free TV for a period of up to seven years in the domestic territory. Then the picture went back to premium pay for its second pay window, except abroad, which I'll come to in a moment. After, uh, in the international territories, the studios have been able to restrict the pay services to only a 12 month, one time window as opposed to two windows in the US 
at 18 and 12 months respectively. But now, today, each studio is structuring its own unique distribution plans as a result of having an in-house streaming capacity and to work around the problems caused by the pandemic. In this B2C scenario, theaters are still first up if the studio involved decides to go to theaters rather than to its own in-house streamer. But if it goes to theaters, in many cases, this is not exclusive. It is non-exclusive with either um, in-house streaming or otherwise. And the pay television, premium pay, which moves up in terms of availability, in the end substitutes for what was third party premium pay or ad supported television, which I'll come back to later on in this speech. The so-called blackout period, which is between the point that the film was no longer in the theaters and the availability of EST. That blackout period has now been reduced or eliminated, which was the goal of all of the major studios for more than a decade. This will enable the studios to save millions of dollars in marketing costs because the marketing that was attendant to the theatrical exhibition will carry over to the OTT pay or what have you windows that immediately follow on an accelerated basis. But I wish now you would think about with all of this change, and I'll take you through studio by studio what has happened. How would a slate financier invest in the slate on a yearly basis distributed by each of the major studios. So I'm now going to describe for you what each major studio has done on a sequential distribution since January of 2020. First up is Universal. Universal caused an uproar by taking Trolls World Tour in April of 2020 directly to PVOD, Premium VOD, and skipping theatrical entirely. Faced then with theaters threatening to boycott all of their films, Universal quickly recovered by making deals with them for exclusive tele theatrical distribution for a minimum of 17 days from initial release, which was then extended automatically to 31 days of exclusivity if during the initial weekend the film performed greater than $50 million at a non-pandemic box office. Uni also gave the theaters that signed to these deals a small piece of the PVOD revenues that it was earning 
and agreed to a small reduction in film rental splits. So you call this dynamic PVOD. Moving on to Warner Brothers or Warner Media, after trying and unfortunately failing with Tenet, a fabulous movie to create a tentpole exclusive theatrical release in the United States in September of 2020. Warner Media preemptorily announced in December that Wonder Woman 1984 and then its entire slate of 17 theatrical releases for 2021 would have a day and date release with its HBO Max streaming outlet, which drove financiers, guilds, talent, and their representatives crazy. A subscriber to HBO Max paying $14.95 a month would not have to pay extra to get the film from Warner Media, which, as I said, was released concurrently on HBO Max with the theaters. The notion was to give choice to the consumer, but we all believe cynically that what it really was trying to do was to attract subscribers to HBO Max. After that uproar, Warner Media has, in quotes, retreated and has now made theater circuit deals in which PVOD or HBO Max would not kick in until 45 days following exclusive theatrical runs. You could call this dynamic SVOD. That's the plan for 2022, publicly announced. Paramount, number three, has devised a similar plan to Warner Media, meaning it's 2022 uh, plan, not 2021, uh, for its Paramount Plus, which is the successor in interest to what was CBS All Access. The Paramount Plus plan will be effective not in 2022 because it has obligations to epics, but will be in essence in full bloom in 2023. As far as Disney's concerned, it has publicly announced many times a title-by-title -title approach to sequential distribution, but it has largely followed a hybrid release pattern. In the future, however, I believe it's more likely than not that Disney will deploy its Marvel, Star Wars, and Fox titles, Fox titles through 2022 on account of Fox's output deal with HBO. And that will be on a 45-day theatrical exclusivity, but it's, I believe, the titles from Pixar, Disney Animation, and other labels like for family pictures or dramas, which will also involve Hulu, will be simultaneous with theatrical and so-called premier access release. So picture a year or two from now for Disney releasing, I'm making this up of course, 12 pictures of which half of them 
are 45 days exclusive and the other six or other half are in essence hybrid releases. Finally, Sony, the arms dealer, made deals with Netflix for pay one TV and Disney Hulu for ad supported television windows, also accelerating availability in the handout, uh, in, in the process. <laughs> I've given you a handout on that uh, from uh, Focus, uh, which I think you'll enjoy reading. So, profit participants and guilds have expressed their concern and in some cases have filed suit or instituted arbitration proceedings challenging the concurrent windows and the arguable elimination of transactions on pay and free TV by virtue of having an in-house subscription platform. These disputes have not been adjudicated. Others have been quietly settled. In several pending cases, the talent lawyers have tried to move the case from what would have been an arbitral decision on a confidential basis to an open federal court proceeding that argues that the parent company of the production distribution and subsidiary has tortiously caused its subsidiary to breach the talent contract by having a hybrid release which cannibalized the theatrical release. We will await judicial uh, decisions on whether the attempt to avoid arbitration and to instead have a tortious cause of action against the parent company uh, will succeed or not. In the home entertainment area, transactional home video or home entertainment <clears throat> is dying quickly with the possible exception of EST. For years now, sell-through packaged goods has been declining at the rate of a billion dollars a year in the United States. And rental packaged goods is even worse off. For the first half of 2021, physical sell-through is under a billion dollars and rental is only 430 million. 20 years ago, those figures were $24 billion. Because of the paucity of films released this year on account of the pandemic, EST, Digital Electronic Sell-Through, is off 29% and rental VOD is off 32% from last year. Digital EST and VOD combined for the first half of 2021 are under or around $2 billion. Customer spending is up on subscription steaming, streaming Netflix, Amazon, Apple, etc., by 21% to $12.2 billion through the first half of this year, reflecting the viewer's appetite 
for new current titles made immediately available on streaming services, not only from the pure streamers, but also from Disney Plus, HBO Max, Amazon, and others simultaneously or in place of a theatrical release. I've given you the DEG uh, report for the half year uh, that you can look at for reference. Now we move to traditional premium pay. In the US, prior to uh, the change, all of the major studios output deals will expire in 2021 with only Fox committed to HBO for 2022 theatrical releases. Each of the studios has announced new plans for what would have been the, pre the premium pay windows. And to no surprise, all of them are going in-house to their own streaming platforms to make them more attractive to potential subscribers. Sony doesn't have a streamer domestically. And so it has set up a uh, five-year output deal with Netflix for premium pay and Disney Hulu for ad-supported television. This change in either acceleration or going in-house will create serious problems for profit participants and guilds because unlike the former practice, when there is an affiliated transaction there is, on a subscription service, there is no performance rate card that tracks theatrical release. So the issue is how does that get resolved? Finally, on ad-supported television, in traditional sequencing, ad-supported TV was available 24 to 28 months after domestic theatrical release, although four of the five major studios do have linear networks, whether over the, uh, whether uh, uh, the big four or cable in the case of Warner Media, the likelihood is that studio streamers will put the pictures on their own streaming service instead of the linear network service. How will they account to participants and guilds? Historically, in the US, Revenues from premium pay and free TV combined approximated more than 30% of the total domestic revenues of the average film. How do you arrive at appropriate pricing for a picture on a subscription service? Let's move to the answer, potentially, which is data. With COVID-19 crushing box office revenues, studios have made drastic moves to get their product in front of audiences. But what hasn't followed is any real sense of how those films are performing on streamers. Is it likely that companies in the audience measurement business will change this situation? Leading candidates would be Comscore, Screen Engine ASI, or of course Nielsen. 
but Nielsen is coming under great pressure on the linear side with each of the big four networks claiming that its ratings for the last broadcast season as reported by Nielsen were below actual ratings. In fact, what has happened is NBCU, obviously controlling its, uh, did its linear network and cable channels, has put out an RFP to over 50 companies, by the way, including, uh, in including Nielsen, to ask them how they would be able to handle data and giving more accurate reports on streaming and other non-linear ways of doing business. The problem is a simple one. There's a need to standardize what a quote view end quote is. Is it two minutes of watching? Is it 70% of the running time of a picture or other answers? The idea would have to be to make all data of the quantity per minutes watched and quality transparent just like box office figures. I've given you a handout to, that discusses this issue as well. Business strategies, the major studios aside, what business strategies will be adopted by the unaffiliated major, Sony, the mini majors, Lionsgate, A24, etc., independent production distribution companies, legendary Skydance Imagine. The likely course is to adhere to the arms dealer approach while at the same time potentially look to be acquired by one of the studio streamers or the giant streamers. Digital cinema, believe it or not, is good news. In October of this year, what was what's called the VPF, virtual print fee, will no longer be imposed on studios that make films available today in 99% of theater venues around the world. In the United States, a consortium of theater owners, the main, the big three, was set up as a partnership with banking institutions to pay a $750 per disc, uh, per disc or per uh, screen fee whenever digital was used. It was supposed to exhaust and be paid off over a 10-year period, but because of the pandemic, the period was extended. But from this October forward, and all you auditors or people, participants who want to audit, studios should look very carefully to see how much the studio is charging for quote print end quote delivery it should be under a hundred dollars probably even under fifty dollars compared to the 750 or 850 that was the going rate before payment was completed that amounts potentially to a five to $10 million savings per, 
picture for large pictures. Now let's look at the cinema. Compared to 2019, the worldwide box office in 2020 was off 70%, 80% in the US. The major studio, uh, the major, um, sorry, chains flirted with bankruptcy and the largest AMC was rescued on a fluke appearance of Reddit and stockholders buying through Robinhood who fought off short sellers and gave AMC liquidity when it most needed it. As long as the pandemic overhangs, I think it's unfortunately safe to say that attendance will stay down, although not hopefully or nearly as bad as it was in 2020. Add to that the increased likelihood of piracy as a result of earlier availability of streamers that can be hacked. As it's happened though, to date, there have been surprisingly few cinema closures due to COVID-19. Furlough schemes, debt financing, governmental loans or grants, and other support systems have been keeping largely the cinemas from becoming zombies. In the medium term, we may see increased closures if a Delta variant continues to plague us. The number of films produced or distributed on a wide basis, 2,000 venues in the United States, will also likely be reduced. So the example that I gave you with Disney going to 12 films and the other majors going to 12, in 2019, there were close to 100 films released by the then six majors. We could be at 60 or 50 of those going forward starting in 2023. So that's my dire concern, not a pretty picture uh, on the theatrical side. So let's look now at streaming and TV. Last year was the worst in history for US cord cutting, according to the renowned research firm of Moffat Nathanson. Pay TV lost 6 million subscribing households in the US with, I'm quoting now, total subscriptions falling by over 7% over the course of the year and with penetration dropping to a level not seen in nearly 30 years. Nonetheless, although pay TV in the US accounts for only 20% of subscriptions, it makes up 75% of earned revenue today. But satellite operators are in the process of disappearing. I give you two examples. One, the AT&T deal with TPG on DirecTV, and two, the useful life of a satellite is 15 years. Neither Direct TV nor DISH has launched a new satellite for beaming down to US households 
in the last five years. Five years from now, there may be no satellites beaming down. What business they will go into, I leave up to their shareholders and boards of directors. Telcos are also losing subs, but by contrast, smart TV companies are booming. Vizio had an IPO in March. Roku reached the highest profit level ever. Ad dollars are moving faster and faster to the digital. Digital ad stocks like Trade Desk are booming. Audience or audience-based ad buying is also spiking. Global streaming revenue, which had fallen almost 4% last year, is predicted to be up more than 5% CAGR for the next five years, cumulative annual growth rate. Streaming video is projected to reach $94 billion at the end of 2025, up 60% from where it is today, of which most will be SVOD and the minority maybe 15% or more on AVOD. Streaming content, according to Group M, the world's largest ad agency, accounted for only 28% of total TV consumption, compared to around 60% for linear. But the 14% of uh, the 28% was double its market share two years ago. So you see how things are going. Total MVPD, that is conventional cable, satellite, and telco, plus virtual MVPD accounted for 10% of all streaming viewing in the quarter, second quarter, and only 3% of all TV viewing. Netflix is by far the largest with 6.5% compared to Amazon's 2.3 and to Disney Plus's 1.5. HBO Max, separate from HBO Cinemax premium cable, is half of Disney Plus. And AVOD is primarily maybe 70% or more on, <laughs> on um, YouTube. With the rest of AVOD, down at roughly 2% of total ad-supported TV, with Pluto, controlled by CBS, being the largest, followed by Tubi, controlled by Fox, and then Roku. Is streaming a good business? We have all these studios moving into the studio streaming business. Research articles by Moffat Nathanson reveal that streaming business models, with the notable exception of Netflix, today are not highly profitable from the traditional PE or EBITDA multiple perspective. Netflix self-funded organic growth and their return on invested capital, ROIC, exceeds the benchmark levels of their media rivals, all of whom have engaged in dilutive M&A activities to try to catch up. Moffat Nathanson does believe that Disney and possibly Warner Media slant discovery can catch up because both companies are, quote, all in on a worldwide streaming basis, 
have valuable libraries and can self-generate subscribers. They are skeptical that many of the nascent SVOD, AVOD services will profitably scale, believing, and now I'm quoting, the real opportunity seems to be in both the shift in ad monetization from linear to digital and the higher TAM, which is total addressable or available market, TAM, outside the U.S. as content owners pivot from pay TV to OTT. So let's look at the linear networks now. As I mentioned last year, TV station fees from retrans and reverse retrans, as well as cable channel affiliation fees from NVPDs and VMVPDs are slowing down rapidly to close to a cost of living CAGR. As the carriers consolidate or see their upside in internet usage with a 90% profit margin, as opposed to subscription fees on content and programming, there is a lot more resistance to double digit increases in affiliation fees or on retrans. And these activities comprise today over 40% of the universe on linear, linear networks. As you all know, the ratings on linear channels have sunk to the lowest levels ever. And while national advertisers continue certainly to look for reach, as opposed to frequency in ads, over time, the streaming outlets are bound to take more and more market share, especially because of their targeting ability. All of the pundits believe that within five years, digital ads will be around 75% of all media dollars. And all of the big four who also control a majority of the ad-supported cable channels will have some very fancy dancing to do in each upfront market as it presents itself in the spring of each year. This year, by all reports, the big four were successful in getting a double-digit double increase compared to 2020 in CPMs. But frankly, I think it was probably because cross-platform CPMs, digital ads, were combined and bundled with the linear fare. The cable, uh, the cable networks are also losing ratings and cash flow as a result of the pandemic and cord cutting. Last year, I discussed what I called the vanishing sitcom and went through the reasons why not only independent producers but also studios with streamer have been backing away from sitcom production. That trend continued into the new fall season for the big four plus the CW, and plus the ad-supported cable channels. For the first time in 50 years, NBC announced its fall schedule with zero comedies in prime time. Sitcoms on the big four plus CW are under 16% of the fall schedule compared to 49% for dramas and 20.5% for game and reality shows. Sports has 9%, but
but we all know how valuable that is, both to the affiliate stations for retrans purposes and for uh, CPMs on network television. Despite, however, their disappearance as the original exhibition outlet on network television, sitcoms have been newsworthy recently for streaming sales of off-network series, namely Seinfeld, The Office, Big Bang Theory, Friends, Modern Family, and from the cable side, South Park. Each of these six garnered more than $500 million from the streamers, on top of perhaps billions from TV stations and cable networks. But none of these sitcoms started production in the last 10 years. Finally, to profit participations for talent in television. All of the studio streamers and the so-called pure streamers and many of the unaffiliated production distribution companies have recently moved to a bonus methodology with talent following the lead of Netflix and Amazon as opposed to the B2B approach on MAGR, Modified Adjusted Gross Receipts, of the last 60 years. The goals for the streamers are twofold. One, have unrestricted control over distribution of the program, whether with third parties or affiliates, and two, specify the exact amount of money that will be paid to talent depending on media and timing, both measures to avoid any audits, claims, or lawsuits. Of interest, the exception to the bonus a trend were the production companies affiliated with the talent agencies. And those deals will cease to exist after June of 2023 on account of the settlements that were made with the WGA. Talent representatives now push in negotiations with production companies or networks to have approval rights over affiliated transactions, usually to no avail. But the major talent involved in each of the six programs I mentioned above did manage to get approval or equivalent rights in the pre-streaming days in their contracts, which is why they are now enjoying nine-figure rewards. As on the feature side, it's unlikely there will be a breakthrough or turnaround in this area unless, one, there's an ability to get access to the streaming data on quantity and quality of, quote, views as a measuring stick, and or, two, a concerted effort by the guilds, unions, to come up with inventive, innovative ways of requiring employers to handle residuals on a transparent performing base, uh, basis and criteria. I'm happy to answer any questions or issues you might want to raise. Susan? Yes, let me get back on screen. Okay, just a second here. We do have some really good questions. And uh, some of them sound like they're perfect follow-ups to what you've been talking about. 
Um, let's start with Stephen Stills is asking about the likelihood. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's going to sing a song too. <laughs> uh, the likelihood that any or all of the studios will report PVOD as home entertainment revenue subject to a royalty. So what's uh, that, the likelihood that they will handle it that way? Um, I believe that one and a half of the studios are now trying to maintain that PVOD is subject to a 20% uh, royalty on the theory that it's replacing uh, home video. Uh, the other studios have not gone in that direction and participants continue to fight in negotiations with these studios uh, for treatment at the either for box office bonus purposes on a feature, the what goes into gross should be the 20 or $30 that the customer pays because that is the quote box office. And in television, it's at it's arguable that whatever is being paid, again, is not being paid on a per program basis. It's being paid on a uh, subscription basis. So how do you measure that without data? Sorry, Steve. <laughs> okay. Sally Weaver would like to know, does Rogers and Shaw merger face regulatory issues? Yes, it does. But I believe that I believe that the merger will be allowed uh, primarily because the benefit to Canadian citizens will be in much greater access to 5G which might not be possible if the merger is turned down. And by the way, I invite the participants to post follow-up questions uh, to Ken's remarks to responding to your question. Now, E. Haldeman would like to know, how would you recommend structuring a back-end deal now in light of the changing landscape? Um, it depends on who you're representing. It depends on whether she or he is willing to walk away. Uh, and so there are all kinds of imponderable factors. The real challenge though is that every studio is different from every other studio. Some for example, NBCU has an ad-supported AVOD, whereas uh, Disney has an SVOD. How does that square? You can't negotiate the deals the same way faced with differences in the approaches. So I can't help you, Barry, except to say that, that talent representatives have to work harder to get what they want from the, quote, old days. Okay. Sal Rosenthal would like to know, what kind of back-end deals do you anticipate for talent in motion picture theatrical deals? That's a little bit similar to something you've addressed. Uh, there's one studio today that's moving toward uh, or trying to move toward box office bonuses as the sole back end for paying talent on features. That isn't true right now for example, at Sony, 
Sony being the arms dealer, is passing through the monies it receives from third-party licensees, whether in the home video or the television area, forget for a moment whether it's on a royalty basis or not, because they don't have their own in-house streamer. So on that basis, arguably, you would rather make a deal with the Sony than you would with the Disney. But again, all things depend. You may be able to get, forgive me, overpaid at Disney and not at Sony. So again, it's horses for courses. Hmm. Drew Nathanson asks, how would you recommend the studios handle negotiations in the future to get an actor to prefer an exclusive streaming releases deal rather than most actors' current view of wanting their work receiving th theater exclusivity. <clears throat> Money conquers all. <laughs> Bottom line. So uh, unless they're silly, they won't look at that. Um, okay. Elon Heimoff, could the new regulatory environment cause a challenge for the proposed mergers, WB slash Amazon, et cetera? Um, yes, but that's all behind closed doors, so we're not going to see what happens. Uh, there will be, um, there will be <clears throat> outreach from both the DOJ and the FTC on the mergers that have been presented <clears throat> to each of them to the Hollywood community. So if you want to be contacted to give your views of whether these mergers should happen or not, that shouldn't be impossible. So um, I'm not trying to encourage people to uh, walk into the Justice Department or the FTC, but uh, they'll, they'll reach out for comments to the public as well as to the industry uh, for guidance. Mitra Ahurian, if I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly. How are streamers able to get away with not releasing data after all these years? It's been <laughs> such a challenge with deal making. Um, look, it, it isn't all these years because to be candid, streaming the way we see it now didn't really start until 2013. It started a little bit earlier, but it was then really in a nascent state. So it's essentially an eight-year child. Uh, from the outset, the uh, Netflix and Amazon did not release data to the public or in a lot of cases, to program suppliers. Now that's a cause celeb, which I'm glad for, but until we break through, um, I, I think we may have to use other means of trying to get uh, readings on uh, popularity and viewing uh, through other sources uh, than from uh, the outlets themselves. Elon Heimoff has a follow-up. Could the new regulatory environment cause a challenge for the proposed... Oh, wait, is that the one You're we already just... Same question. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Maria... Damata Mulero, do you have any information about Emma Stone's deal for Cruella 2, or do you have a theory on how a deal was reached following Scarlett Johansson's lawsuit? Um, 
my law firm represents Emma and I have no comment. We understand. E. Halderman, again, can you comment on the major tentpole pictures being held for release that are based on box office bonuses? What position should talent take, including directors or producers? Do you take the Johansson approach with a lawsuit? Again, it's all a matter of individual negotiation on individual deals. And I don't think that there's a overriding need for what I'll call uniformity. Uh, there's, uh, there are clients who prefer the simplicity of box office bonuses because you look at the trade papers or at uh, Comscore and you have an easy answer to how well your picture is doing. Uh, and there are others who say, no, I want to participate in all media. So that follows the AGR or MAGR approach of the last 60 years. But each client, for my purposes, has the right to select which way to go on any particular deal. And that's the conversation that we in our firm conduct uh, with the clientele. From Lorna Wilson, do you have any information on how indie filmmakers have fared in the pandemic environment, particularly since streaming seems to be more of a viable distribution option for them? Um, they were obviously, forgive me, slaughtered last year because not only from COVID, but all of the Indies pictures require bank financing because they pre-sell to foreign markets. And when you have bank financing, that's accompanied by a completion bond. The completion guarantors refused to insure against COVID events. So there was basically no insurance available to Indies. So they either had to turn what would normally be debt into equity, which was really difficult, or forgive me, go to mom and pop for credit cards and <laughs> trying to produce their picture on family funding, uh, which hurt. Uh, I don't see a lot of green as opposed to yellow or red in the independent motion picture sector. Uh, it may well be better in the international markets than it is here. Does that also affect um, trying to get into festivals, uh, which most are, are not happening, but... Um... Well, that'll depend in part on the rules of the festival mm -hmm. and what constitutes, forgive me, a theatrical motion picture. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, Matthew Hurwitz, how much leverage do the theatrical chains have in fighting to keep any theatrical window? How likely is it that we will soon see no theaters and no theatrical window with initial release being to consumers at home? Initial release being to consumers I, at home. Okay. Um, I don't think that that um, cataclysmic event happens uh, in this decade. I am not sure what happens in the 30s, 2030s, but I think we're in for the remainder of this decade, but with reduced exclusivity on the feature uh, side to theaters, 
delays, again, of 1731 days or 45 days, uh, as opposed to day and date uh, streaming. But again, it doesn't surprise me at all if the number of pictures released theatrically, whether exclusively or not, goes down from 100 to maybe half of that. From Jeremy Goldman, any comments on NFTs, non-fungible tokens, the latest craze on the blockchain? And have you seen NFTs coming up in contracts with major talent or with studios? Um, that was uh, de rigueur for several weeks uh, after the announcement of a $69 million dollar quote, NFT painting, uh, but I think it's cooled off. There are serious SEC issues uh, in terms of disclosure and stuff like that. It's also an extremely complex situation in terms of the technical aspects of it all. So um, I, I, I confess I'm not a current uh, fan of that, but things may change. It doesn't appear we have any further questions at the moment. Does anyone sure. want a last opportunity to pose one? And we are uh, getting close to our finish. Um, do you want to give some hopeful comments now <laughs> about <laughs> the industry? Um, well, the, the hope the hope that I have, as I said, is that independent firms, whether that's Netflix, Comscore, or one of the 48 others that NBCU has gone out to, are able to give data to the community, whether on a confidential basis or not, just as Nielsen has done in the past. There's a whole bunch of information that Nielsen gives to its, in effect, subscribers that it doesn't make public. I would hope that that would be true in what I'll call the new world of streaming data and that we can find something uh, where we get more visibility than we have now. Again, the alternative to that is a concerted effort on the part of the guilds and unions, not on the participation side, because that's not, quote, minimum, uh, minimums in, in the parlance of the labor trade, but residuals that may be different depending upon performance. So we'll see how those negotiations transpire in the next year or two. And for further advice from Ken, you can always sign up for his USC entertainment courses. No, UCLA. UCLA. Oh, sorry. Please, please. <laughs> yes. Um, there is uh, one comment on chat. It's about uh, whether or not the YouTube channel link will be available soon so you can re-watch the program. And it, you'll be getting an email from the Beverly Hills Bar Association regarding that. So if no further questions or comments, Ken, thank you so much again. Pleasure. And uh, nice to see you looking healthy and happy. And, and we look forward to reaching out to you for next year to see if you'll do this again. I thank you, I everybody. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Thanks to all. Again. Thank you. Bye-bye.